magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and in this video, I'm going to be reviewing the changes to the balance data slate and the rules commentary in the January 2024 update to Warhammer 40,000 with an eye towards what those changes mean for Eldari players. Yes. Now, as always happens when a faction gets nerfed, and uh, spoiler alert, we Eldari did get nerfed. We knew this was coming. Uh, as always happens when a faction gets nerfed, there are some diehard fans on social media who are pretty upset. Declarations abound that Eldari suck now and that GW only cares about their precious space marines and that we might as well sell our collections on eBay, diminish, and go into the West like some sad-ass Sindarians in an emo elf Tolkien spinoff. Uh, so I'm going to ruffle a few helmet plumes here by declaring that actually it's not that terrible. Uh, frankly, it's just not that bad. As expected, certain Eldari abilities and units were hit pretty hard by the balance data slate. And if I'm totally honest, I do think that one of one or two of these changes are inelegant solutions to problems that could have been better solved in other ways. Nevertheless, uh, craft worlds are still going to be fun and effective in both competitive and casual play. And the January data slate is by no means a death sentence for space elves making it to the podium at GTs. I, I do think that it might be the end of Eldari as one of the top two factions in the meta. If, if we even still were as of a week ago, I, I actually doubt that we still were, but uh, I think we're definitely not now. But serious tournament players will still be able to field Eldari armies without having to worry that doing so means that they can't get a good result. We're still going to see space elves on podiums. Uh, it's just, instead of being like S tier, now we're just going to be very, very good. One of many very, very good factions in the game. Also, frankly, it sucks playing one of the top one or two top factions in Warhammer because every time you win, your opponent can imply that the only reason for your victory is that you autopiloted some netlist. Even if your list was totally off meta, your opponent may not know that. And it's you know, th this is always kind of hanging over the game. I've had a lot of people on my Discord say that uh, they haven't even wanted to play their elves as much for the past few months because they're just sort of tired of that. So... I would rather play a faction that is strong enough to perform well in tournament play, or play, but not so routinely on podiums that it's actively resented by other players. And although Eldari were in a much better place than they were at the release of 10th edition, they were still maybe a little bit ahead of those other armies that are just good. And for those reasons, I'm not upset about the overall change to the competitive prox prospects for Eldar. Uh, I think we're still going to do well. It's just... It's no longer a couple of superpowers. Now it's a, a bunch of powerful. Uh, or, or maybe there's going to be a new superpower and it won't be us. I think Necrons are actually a contender for that. And I'm also okay with that. So in this video, I'm going to run you through what changed specifically for Aldari, both in terms of our particular faction and the game overall. Uh, I'm not going to cover every change to the general rules because other content creators have done that and there, there's tons of them and the majority of the changes are irrelevant for the majority of us. I will talk about the uh, the biggest non-Eldari, just general game updates. Okay, uh, let's start with points increases, which will be quick because there are only two. I was, I was concerned that there would be more. There were only two. Night Spinners went up 30 points to 210 points, which is significant. That's a lot. And Wraith Guard went up 20 points to 190 for five or uh, 380 for 10. So 20 points for every five Wraith Guard. Wraith Blades did not go up. Uh, a a 210-point Night Spinner, though, is, is pretty expensive, especially as they were also subject to the Old Games Workshop double nerf, whereby the unit gets worse and the cost goes up, which has also happened with a lot of items at the grocery store lately. So it's like a bit of a trigger, like 20% less sausage for 20% more money is kind of disappointing. Uh, so in addition to the not insignificant points increase, the Spinner's Doomweaver no longer prevents enemy units from advancing when it pins them. Instead, they suffer minus two to their movement characteristic, minus two to advance rolls, and minus two to charge rolls. 
This is still significant for controlling enemy movement. It effectively reduces an advance move by four uh, and, and units that could advance and charge are down six. And that's generally enough to keep key enemy units or a key enemy unit out of position for an extra turn. But at 630 points, triple night spinners are not likely to be a staple of competitive lists. There were a lot of triple night spinner lists before. I was running two in my most competitive list. I think some tournament lists may still want a single night spinner for movement control as the ability to put the brakes on a fast enemy unit that's out of line of sight can seriously impede an opponent's ability to counter fragile speedy space elves. But 210 points is going to hurt. It's it's something you've got to build for and really think about. But honestly, overall, I don't think that this is a bad change. It's not how I would have fixed Night Spinner Spam, uh, but Night Spinner Spam did need fixing. So this is, I think this is kind of fine. Uh, the, the other unit that took a beating was Wraith Guard. 10 Wraiths led by a Spirit Seer that can resurrect them and improve their shooting has kind of been a staple in the Eldari lists that were, were winning GTs or getting to the podium in GTs. They didn't all have the 10 wraiths, but most of them did. Uh, in addition to the 40 point hike and the cost of the typical 10 elf wraith unit, Wraith Guard also had a clarification added to their data sheets that when they use their wraith construct ability to shoot, they must target the unit that fired at them. And they can do so only if that unit is eligible. So the way it was phrased before, like theoretically, they could just shoot some unit. Uh, and also it's been clarified that not only do they have to shoot the unit that shot them, but that unit has to be eligible. So they need a line of sight. It can't be a lone operative. Now, some tournament organizers had already ruled that this is how it should work anyway. And honestly, I think it's obviously very likely the most original, the, the, the obvious intent of the original rule. I don't think GW ever intended for Wraith Guard to just be able to shoot anybody when they shot. I think it was supposed to be retaliatory. And so, again, I'm kind of fine with this. Uh, if it were just the 40 points and the change to the data card, I would say that it's not, it's actually not overly heavy. And 40 points is a lot, but like I, I could sort of see it. But there were also two additional indirect nerfs aimed at. Wraith Guard uh, that have definitely diminished their desirability as uh, an anvil or, or centerpiece for an army. The first is a change to the Fate's Messenger Enhancement, which you may remember lets a unit on each player turn after you've rolled the dice, change a result for a hit, uh, a hit roll, uh, a wound roll, or a saving throw, not a damage roll. This is, um, this, the, so the change only the model that actually has face, Fate's Messenger can do this because technically the way that it was written before, not technically, it was very clearly written that if a model is leading a unit, either the model with Fate's Messenger can do this or a model in the unit can do this. It, it only came up in a couple of rare situations. So uh, if a Wraith, if a Spirit Seer were leading a unit of Wraith Guard and you gave it Fate's Messenger, it could guarantee that one of the Wraith Guard did devastating wounds so every turn, you'd like fire the 10 shots with the Wraith Cannons, and you'd probably do devastating wounds with at least one, and then you'd change a failed wound to devastating wounds, and you'd push through a bunch of devastating wounds, and so it was devastating. Well, now your Spirit Seer, your spirit seer can no longer do that. You can still do it with some Fate Dice, right? It's like, it's still, they still have really powerful shooting, but it does uh, slightly limit the, the ability to, to dial it up to 11. Uh, now, this change to Fate's Messenger has, n has no effect on the Death Jester, which is another popular candidate for Fate's Messenger, and it has no effect on the Wayleaper, which is a sometimes candidate for Fate's Messenger. And in my unit focus videos on each of those, I talk about how to make that combo work. It's still totally intact. Uh, that said, this change to Fate's Messenger, which I really do think was aimed at the Spirit Seer, does have an unfortunate unintended consequence of torpedoing a really fun combo that people were, people were using in like semi-casual 40K like or semi-competitive 40K and 1,000 point play. Um, or if you're just, if you, if you were trying to run a, an exclusively Wraith list, uh, you used to be able to have a Spirit Seer follow around a Wraith Lord. And if you used a Fate die and Fate's Messenger, you could hit with both Bright Lances 
on Overwatch, and then because of the Spirit Seer's lethal hits ability, the Bright Lances would also um, auto wound. This was a little bit overcosted for the lack of once you add the cost of the Spirit Seer and the enhancement to the already probably overcosted Wraith Lord. Uh, it, it was a little overcosted for the Wraith Lord's lack of durability, but it, for its points. But it was a really cool trick, and really fun and it leaves me with very little to talk about in my now not upcoming video on uh wraith lords and wraith seers which i was going to do in a single video but i think i'm gonna maybe put on the back burner now so uh sad sad times for that semi-competitive combo um it was you know could, you could also be used in competitive play but it definitely was not like an auto include but it was good uh the the last nerf that is indirectly aimed at Wraith Guard is the only rules change that I'm actually kind of annoyed about, if I'm totally honest, and that is the change to Phantasm. So my favorite Eldari stratagem no longer lets an infantry unit move seven inches at the end of the opponent's movement phase. Now the move is D6. And I actually think that this one, of all of the changes, and there are already people writing angry comments disagreeing with this, but I actually think that of all of the changes, this one is the most significant for Eldari. Uh, and arguably the most devastating. And the reason that I'm kind of annoyed is that it punishes a lot of units that were not making the cut for competitive lists, but were good enough for semi-competitive play, like Reapers, which really needed Phantasm to work the way that it did before, and now it doesn't. The, the story on the street is that Phantasm was altered in large part to curtail the speed and maneuverability of those big Wraith Guard units that were like in every list which as sleepy, dazed ghost warriors are not supposed to be fast and tricky. Uh, and it, it does that, right? Like, so your Wraith Guard are no longer going to be able to, on turn one, advance and use Phantasm and possibly even also Fire and Fade. Uh, what I don't love about this is that taking away the reliability of Phantasm after it was already previously nerfed to only apply to infantry, cuts down significantly on clever play and also very thematically Aldari play with units that were not overpowered. Uh, even if it had been changed to like, you move three to six inches instead of seven inches, it still would have been viable. Maybe there was a way to like not let Wraiths use it. I don't know. Um, but the possibility that you will spend a CP on, on Phantasm and only like roll a one or even a two and just not be able to do the thing is pretty brutal especially as Wraith Guard already got a big points increase and they've already been limited in, in, in other ways. This is also a, a sad change for Wraith Blades, which relied on Phantasm to move up the board quickly in order to be even like borderline viable. Uh, I did a unit focus on them and I talk about this trick. Uh, and they, for Wraith Blades, because they didn't get the 40 point increase, might have started seeing competitive play with a Spirit Seer as a Wraith Guard alternative. And I guess they still might. Uh, but without the ability to be fast and having no shooting, and so your opponent can just kind of play around them to some degree, uh, they're just not as appealing as, as I would like them to be. There's also, there's also an impact here for hawks and spiders and dragons and rangers and fugin, and the, the, impact, to, the impact on uh, warp spiders may have been intentional it prevents warp spiders from being just absolutely insanely fast and i really thought we were going to see a straight up nerf to the warp spider data slate and or data sheet excuse me and there just wasn't one so maybe that maybe that much also is intentional but this does seem a little bit like uh, a, a rules change that maybe is going to affect too many units and also prevent some other units that might have emerged from the bench to finally get their moment in the sun from being able to do that it's like uh, okay, so Wraith Blades are out and maybe that creates, or Wraith Guard are out and maybe that creates room for something else. And now some of those units that might have might have been able to come out are, are not as able to do that. And that's too bad. I still think that the Eldari Codex is really deep and we're going to find plenty of new tricks. And uh, there, there, there are plenty of units that I was like almost using before uh, that maybe now I will, I will find, I will find some uses for. Um, practically speaking, I think the change to Phantasm means that Autark Wayleapers are even more essential for the extra CP because Fragile Elves rely on movement shenanigans. And Fire and Fade is now our only intact, reliable movement shenanigan 
Uh, but at, at 2 CP, you really need the Wayleaper to make Fire and Fade work. But I think at least I'm going to be using Fire and Fade a lot more in my games, which means I'm going to have, I'm probably going to be spending like two or three CP more than I was, which means I'm not spending those CP on other things. So I'm going to have to rethink how I build lists and strategize. Also, it makes um, uh, Floaty McFloaterson uh, Shadow Specters even more desirable because Shadow Specters can still just inherently battle focus. Uh, they, they basically have autonomous phantasm built in and so those, those forge world aspect warriors are now even more desirable than they were before and they were already really good i should probably make my next uh unit focus on them i think that they they're they're uh they've definitely emerged as extra extra excellent after the data slate um changes the other uh big change that's going to affect all of us even casual aut autarchs who are not running any wraith guard or night spinners is the change to fate dice and when i said earlier i think phantasm is actually the most impactful change at least two people before watching the rest of the video wrote angry comments about how no how can you say that it's the fate dice uh it's a big change so instead of starting the game with 12 fate dice you now start with six and this obviously is a very big deal but perhaps not the total cataclysm that it has been portrayed as in various social media posts already uh, Fate Dice are still one of the best faction abilities in the game. Here's what the change from 12 to 6 means practically now that we're starting with half as many as, as before. So first of all, you will now never re-roll, right? Uh, before, if you rolled very badly, you could re-roll your 12 Fate Dice, but you're only re-rolling 11 to try to fish for better numbers. You will now never do that, and you will now always take a Farseer because a Farseer lets a model... Uh, within range of it on your turn and then also on your opponent's turn, treat any fate die as a six. And if you're only starting the game with six, your Farseer will be able to generate more sixes if it survives the game over the course of the game than you have fate dice. So there's there's just no reason. You never give up dice for a reroll. Uh, it's also going to be harder to guarantee that a unit that is out of range of your Farseer will be able to auto hit with sixes on Overwatch. I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. The Overwatch trick is really powerful. Arguably, it's kind of overpowered. If you at least need to like plan geographically for distance from the Farseer, which you need to sort of keep out of line of sight because it doesn't have lone operative, I think that is maybe a reasonable but balanced mechanic. Um, the other uh, impact that this is going to have, and this is one that I really like, is that units and abilities that generate extra fate dice are now seriously worth considering. With 12 fate dice, you just really didn't need to do this before after the rules were changed so that you can only use one per phase. It was like at that point, I kind of had all of the fate dice that I could use in a game. And now um, you really might want a unit of guardian defenders to sit on your own home objective and generate more fate dice for you. I think that's like very seriously worth considering. Uh, Eldred who gives you three additional fate dice. That's like, you, you go 50% from six to nine at the beginning of the game really might be worth considering now, whereas before he really wasn't. I still wish that he could use his doom ability from out of line of sight, but whatever. Uh, we may see Eldred showing up in some lists. He may, he may move up the priority list for a unit focus video, especially um, for you Ulthway players, right? Uh, and the enhancement uh, the Weeping Stones, which gives the unit that takes it an extra fate die ever, or gives you an extra fate die every time the unit that takes it destroys an enemy unit, potentially is not a bad include on something like an Autark Wayleaper. That might get you another fate dice or two at the end of the game when you need them. Uh, th there's some other ways to, to generate additional fate dice that I'm, I'm not as, I'm not quite as sold on, but I think that the, um, certainly the Guardian Defenders and maybe Eldred are, are, going to change in their relative value. Uh, lastly, I think that from now, from here on, we will probably be using Fate Dice almost exclusively to auto-generate sixes for damage, for overwatch, and for really, really important saving throws that because of the modifications, will only succeed on a six. Uh, but the occasional advance roll will, will still be a thing. But I, I don't, at least in my games, I would sometimes in phases where I didn't really need them for anything else, be like, sure, I'll go ahead and use that Fate Die roll of a three to hit even though I would have hit on a three or sure I'll use that four 
to to auto succeed on on a thing and I, I just think that the occasional kind of like well i have extra uh assurance pseudo sloppy use of fate dice is is gone we're gonna have to be very intentional about them and that's probably not bad like eldar should be a high skill cap somewhat punishing <laughs> army to, to play that's kind of their that's kind of their thing it's uh they they reward clever, cl uh, clever careful play and 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 punish mistakes that's always been that's always been the play style uh, another key unit that took a hit to its data card, so this is not a, not a change for everybody, but is, um, is the Yincarn. And we all thought the Yincarn would get some kind of nerf because uh, it, was, it, was, it was doing really well in top competitive GT lists. Um, but I will say that uh, it did not also get a points increase, which I really appreciate. I, I, I've never liked the GW uh, double nerf where you where it both gets more expensive and and it gets worse. I feel like you, you fix it one way or, or the other So so here's what happened uh, The suspiciously slaneshi looking incarnation of the elder god of death Now can only teleport to the location of a destroyed unit once per turn and only on its owner's turn So you can still blow something up in your opponent's backfield teleport in with the yincarn shoot with it charge with it, strip your opponent of their home objective, uh, throw a little death elf god party, and then have incoming damage. You can still do that. Uh, here are things you can no longer do. You can no longer, after you have done that on your same turn, kill an enemy unit in the midfield in melee and teleport the Yincarn back to safety. Nor can you use the Yincarn to guarantee that you continue to hold an objective on your opponent's turn by just teleporting onto that objective when the unit controlling it dies. Now, that is a that is a significant limitation, but the Yincarn is still good, and because it didn't get a points increase, I think it's still viable. Also, the way that your average, like, intermediate elf player was using the Yincarn, I, I think has not been affected at all. I mean, the, stand, the standard way that, like, uh, a pretty good competitive player who is going to use the the Yincarn is going, is going to be to do the first thing that I described. The sort of like tactical yo-yo play with the Yincarn uh, that I, only I think really, really top elf players were pulling that one off. And and I, I'm sorry to see those tricks dis disappear, but if the Yincarn had to get some kind of nerf, I'm glad it's this and not like a 65 point increase in cost or like it can no longer charge when it teleports, or I'm glad it's this. I think that it could have been a lot worse. Now, that's it for changes specifically to Craft World's units and rules. And even if one or more of these uh, are disappointing to you, like Phantasm is to me, I think it's worth acknowledging that GW had the good graces not to handle roughly every unit that has been appearing in top lists. Uh, I thought we might see changes to the Avatar of Cain. I am delighted that we did not. I was worried a little bit about the Wayleaper, and nothing happened there. And I had heard a rumor that Fugan was going to get a spanking, and Fugan did not. And it's really nice to still be able to use a Phoenix Lord in competitive play. Um, so it, it's, I think overall, this was not terrible. It definitely could have been worse. And for the most part, I'm, I'm not particularly bothered by the changes. I honestly am not bothered by the change to Fate Dice. I actually think it's interesting and fun and will lead to interesting decision making. Uh, it's really only Phantasm that has my elven panties in a knot. Okay, here are some other alterations and clarifications to be aware of. Uh, there, there are actually a ton. If you, if you look at the document, there are tons of rules clarifications, but most of these really just amount to keeping mischievous and morally bankrupt rules lawyers from arguing stuff that is obviously insane or clearly contrary to the intent of the rule. So I'm not, I am not going to talk about the majority of them, but a few are pretty important. And here are the ones that I think that you actually need to know. The first one is big and it's actually good for space elves. Uh, units can disembark from transports the turn that they arrive. This had been much debated uh, a lot of people had ruled that un units could not do this, but GW has made it clear you can bring a Falcon in from Deep Strike, nine inches from enemy units, and the, the fire dragons inside of it can get out of it 
as long as they continue to stay nine inches from enemy units. They count as having made a normal move. They then cannot charge, uh, and they can't make another move. But it's, but this is good. It's it's good news. Uh, we can now, we can now put falcons into deep strike again. Also, um, death jesters coming out of falcons can be sort of interesting, and this is good for death jesters uh, or fugan coming out of a falcon. This could be interesting for fugan. Uh, it has also been clarified that units that ignore modifiers also ignore modifiers to the damage characteristic. This is bad. This is bad for us. It's very bad news for the Avatar of Cain and the Yinkarn. And maybe um, maybe this is why uh, the Avatar and the Yinkarn did not get points increases. Uh, it, it, there's still a limited amount of data sheets in the game that ignore modifiers, but there are data sheets. But, but it's not that limited, and so th this gives people another tool against uh, our most durable units. Another one of the changes, I should have mentioned this before, one of the effects of Wraithguard getting like a quadruple nerf, essentially, I, and it's not clear that they're totally unplayable or anything, but they've definitely been significantly reined in, is I think that the Avatar of Kane, because you need a durable bully unit to play the midfield. I think the Avatar of Kane, which is significantly cheaper than the Wraith Guard and very durable and very dangerous, is going to be even more common in uh, Eldari tournament lists. So it, if we are playing the Avatar even more, it's important to remember that now that there is this limitation on the, the Avatar's durability that we need to play around a little bit. When you're deciding which of your opponent's units to kill, uh, you're going to target the ones that ignore modifiers if you're running the Avatar. Uh, here's another one, another change. This is much less important. Units disembarking from transports, transports do not count as having made a normal move for reactive purposes. So units like uh, Eldari Rangers or Tyranid Termagants that can like scuttle away or scuttle forward when a unit finishes a move within nine inches of them, that doesn't trigger when you're coming out of a transport. So if you were trying to engage some enemy unit uh, that could scuttle and you had a Falcon, um, this really... I don't think this is going to matter a great deal for us. It means you can't run away with your rangers if an enemy transport comes near your rangers, but like, I don't think you're really that worried about your rangers getting killed. Uh, well, you are because you're compassionate and every elf life is, is important and, and all that, but with, with uh, respect to winning games. Okay, um, another change. Uh, this So there's a rule that's been much debated going all the way back to 9th edition, and that is... When uh, a unit has a redeploy power, can it still use its like infiltrate ability? And in ninth edition, the way the rules were phrased, it seemed like no, and then it was debated in tenth edition, and now GW has clarified that yes, yes, you can. If you have an ability that lets you redeploy, say in the movement phase, and a unit has uh, infiltrators, you, when it redeploys, it can redeploy somewhere in the midfield. It has to follow the usual rules, like outside of nine inches of an enemy unit. Uh, we don't, we're not running, we, we space elves are not currently running a lot of like redeploy powers. Sorry, Prince Uriel. Uh, generally re redeploy powers are only really desirable if you can use them after you know who's getting first turn and we don't have one of those Tyranids do. Um, but it does mean that you probably do want at least one infiltrating unit of your own, maybe two, to be out screening your, your list in the beginning of the game so that your opponent can't like infiltrate something within move and charge distance of your fragile elf backline. Uh, okay. Uh, lastly, for big overall rules changes, um, heroic intervention. It says in the rules that when a unit, if, if a unit heroically intervenes, it doesn't receive a charge bonus. And GW clarifies that this only means it doesn't get the fight's first charge bonus. If you are armed with lances, you still get the charge bonus. Now, in the unlikely event that you are running Shining Spears or an Autark uh, Skyrunner, then this potentially matters. So probably it, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that's it. Um, the, the, the only other thing before I wrap up uh, is I, I'd like to mention some Drakari changes because they are important for Yanari. Yanari, Yanari got a little boost. So Fire Dragons and, and other things coming out of Falcons got a little boost and Yanari got a little boost by virtue of the fact that several Drakari units actually enjoyed significant points reductions. And uh, these are available in a Death Elf list. 
where they do have access to the detachment bonus, they can use the rerolls, but they cannot use strands of fate. Uh, now these are not these are still these are not the the Drakara units that are most desirable in a Unari list, but they are but they're not bad, and I think we might really think about them now. Uh, most notably, the Succubus is now only forty five points. That is a significant reduction. That is a cheap combat character that you really might want to think about. Uh, the, the Archon, which is a good combat character and pretty cheap, can now lead Incubi, which got a points reduction, as did the transports that they, they ride around in. So if you are a Yunari player, you may now want to uh, take a second look at Drakari transports and the Succubus in particular, and also Archons leading Incubi around. And at some point, I'll do a video just on playing Yunari. So that's what I've got. Uh, there are obviously going to be other changes as a result of the data slate that affect, affect craft worlds because other armies will have become stronger or weaker depending on their changes and therefore will become more or less common in the meta, which will change how we build if you are playing competitively. Uh, most, notable, most notably, Chaos Space Marines took an absolute beating, especially those big units of accursed cultists uh and some of the things that you can do with with marks uh really got toned down I, csm players are saying that like now cast space marines are doomed until they get their own codex and i think that's a little i think that's probably going a little far um but it is true that i think that cast space marines like eldar are no longer going to be like right on 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 the total top of the meta while on the other hand necrons actually got some boosts despite early evidence suggesting that they were already contenders for uh, top faction or one of the top factions. So maybe Necrons are going to be the, uh, the, the, the undead nemesis to beat, which is very thematic for us, and that, and that could be fun. In the coming weeks, we'll see how the global and local metas shift, uh, which will certainly affect how we think about list building, but um, that's part of the fun of the hobby. And some of you don't care about global metas because, let's be honest, most 40K players are probably playing six to 10 games a year uh, with their friends and, and, and that's fine. But um, you know, even your local meta may change a little bit. So, so that's what I've got. That's uh, the January data slate in a nutshell for Space Elf players. If, uh, if, you, if you liked this video, I hope you'll click a like. If you've not subscribed, I hope you'll subscribe. Uh, and I was expecting this data slate on on thursday when they usually release these things but they promised us january i guess so they surprised us all and it came out on tuesday uh i i'm hoping to get another video in for uh the weekend i've been trying to do saturdays um but we'll but we'll see uh whatever the case i will be back soon with new content and until then best of luck with your pointy ears take care